Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's episode is titled The Presidency of Jimmy Carter, and I'm pleased to be joined by Julian Zelizer, Professor of History and Public Affairs in the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Today is September the 13th, 2022. On behalf of my uh, education team, Mike and Meredith and Raven, I want to welcome all of you to tonight's uh, session. This is our fourth of our 43 session season here in 22-23. Um, it feels like we've been doing them now for, for more than a few weeks. It's wonderful to see so many of you back joining us, uh, likely leaving your classrooms just a few moments ago if you're on the West Coast, maybe uh, just finishing up dinner or pushing it aside so you can uh, join the conversation tonight if you're here on the East Coast. In particular, I want to reach out and thank uh, several of you for uh, continuing your loyal attendance. That includes Brittany, who's in Pennsylvania County in Virginia, just a few hours north of me here in Chapel Hill. Uh, Pamela, it's great to see you back. Uh, Pamela's in Georgia, I think just outside of Atlanta, and may have some particular insights to our topic tonight. Lois, wonderful to see you again. I see uh, that you've had a busy summer. Lois is in Oregon. Carrie's down in Florida. Cheryl is in Modesto. Talina and Josh, uh, I hope you recognize that you're both in the room tonight after spending a week at the center this past July in our Teaching African American Studies uh, program. It's great to see both of you. Hey, Scott, Reagan High School, Papptown, uh, North Carolina, not too far from here. Um, and Teresa, uh, the, the biggest drive-by truckers fan uh, out in Western North Carolina is with us as well. As always, we have some Los Angeles teachers, just a few with us tonight. Uh, Janet at Markham Middle School, uh, Seda, Jacqueline, Brenda, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. I'm hopeful that the conversation will uh, not only give you insights to the topic, but uh, give you a chance to think about ways to infuse uh, what you're teaching the curriculum you're responsible for uh, with, with, um, with, with knowledge where the gaps are, and we're going to address that as we move uh, throughout the night. The National Humanities Center, located in Durham, North Carolina, was founded in the second year of President Carter's uh, term, 1977, and 44 years later, we uh, just welcomed our new fellowship class to the center last week. And as you can imagine, it's not unlike uh, the start of a school day, of a school year, I should say, in which everyone is walking in with their name tags on, trying to figure out uh, where to eat uh, for lunch, who to sit with, um, walking with their feet forward so you can check out their new, uh, their new pumps that they bought over the summer. It's really wonderful to have the energy of our scholars back in the building and uh, for it to, to surface uh, very much in the same ways that having uh, the students that you work with in the schools uh, that, you, uh, that you are working in. Um, all of the work that we create at the National Humanities Center is intended to be free and open to educators at all levels. Uh, we find that it's important work both instructionally and in terms of understanding the content at the K-12 level, certainly, but also the post-secondary level. And you can find all that work located here in the Humanities Class Digital Library. Each of you have a library card, and before each of our uh, webinar sessions, we send an email that's got a link that specifically goes to the readings and the viewings and the resources that our scholars have curated in advance. In some ways, I think this is maybe some of the most important part of uh, the, the five hours you'll spend with us because it gives you a chance to prepare for the discussion, maybe more importantly, because you guys are all busy, busy educators, uh, that you have these resources to reflect on once the session is concluded. And you might go back and listen to the recording, or you might think of ways to pull some of those threads of something you've learned or something that's been clarified into some kind of instructional resource. If you go to this resource, you'll find uh, several articles that Professor Zelzer has published uh, more recently and has made available in support of tonight's session. And again, these are intended to be uh, a free use and, I'm sorry, open uh, source and free use for you in your classrooms. This is also the same resource where we will put the recording of tonight's session as well as the PowerPoint. I hope you do take a moment to look through the remaining webinars. I suspect many of you went through and signed up for a whole bunch of them all at once, but you probably maybe moved through some of them and maybe you weren't quite sure what this webinar format was like. If you're new to the season, it might be that um, you had some conflicts with some of the dates, but I would encourage you to take a look at uh, the many different multidisciplinary sessions we have scheduled. If you're particularly interested in positioning America on a world stage or maybe finding a different um, entry point to the more traditional and conventional American narrative, you might consider these four uh, sessions that are scheduled before Christmas. In just a few weeks, I'll be joined by Woody Holton, another former Virginian, 
uh, who is at University of South Carolina and will be uh, talking with us about his recent publication, Liberty is Sweet, The Hidden History of the American Revolution. Just a week later, uh, Lauren Turek from Trinity University in Texas will join us to discuss her work um, understanding Christian nationalism and the ways that evangelicals and religion has played a role in foreign policy in the modern history era. Just a week later, uh, Michael Altman from the University of Alabama will join us to share his digital resource, uh, which focuses on collecting uh, primary sources and ways to unpack and teach the events of January the 6th, 2021. And then finally, later in December, past fellow Alan Taylor, who's currently at the University of Virginia, uh, will be uh, working with us on his publication, America Republics, 1783 to 1850. It could be that joining us on these webinar nights is uh, the time you have and the way that you'd like to engage, but some of you might uh, be interested in a deeper dive and spending more energy and time earning more professional development credits. If that's the case, I encourage you to take a look at our online course catalog. These courses uh, earn 35 professional development credits and range a wide variety of humanities topics, all of which attempt to really better understand the world we live in, the identities that we assume, and the ways that we can ask our students to tap into uh, those, those kinds of perspectives. It could be, for example, that uh, if you're interested in teaching late 20th century American history, that this course, uh, My Piece of the American Pie, Race, Gender, and Sexuality in Contemporary American Music might be helpful. All of our work is informed by our hardworking Teacher Advisory Council. I'm excited to welcome these 20 wonderful educators to the center in Durham next week for a two-day retreat. Um, I want to thank them in advance for all of the ways that they've remained engaged and look forward to, uh, to being in this mutually beneficial relationship for the coming year. Tonight, the webinar is audio only, meaning you'll hear our voices and see the PowerPoint, uh, but you will not see our faces. This is not a Zoom meeting, and so uh, that, that fatigue you get after looking at ourselves and looking at ourselves in screens all the time uh, will not set in. However, we do want you to remain engaged, and the best way to do that is through the audience chat box. Located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, this is where you can communicate with each other, you can uh, you get to know each other, you can share links, you can ask questions. More importantly, if you'd like to ask Professor Zelizer a question, please do use the Ask the Professor tab just above it, and that will come to me as the moderator. I'll curate those questions, queue them up, and then when we take a break, I'll bring them forward and give you direct citation. So again, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. This is the Humanities in Class webinar titled The Presidency of Jimmy Carter. I'm pleased to be joined by lead scholar Julian Zelizer, Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University. I'd also like to welcome George Nips to uh, the program tonight. George is a high school teacher in Leland, North Carolina, in the southeastern part of the state. As the TA tonight, George is going to be in the uh, audience chat. He's going to be asking questions, making comments, kind of keeping things lively. And then George is going to be working in the coming weeks to take something that he learns tonight, something that he identifies, and turning it into an instructional product so that we can then share it with you in the digital library. And ultimately, that's our goal for all of our work, that is to take scholarship and translate it to practice, to take theory and translate it to instruction. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, hey, Professor, can you hear me up in New Jersey? Professor, I think you need to unmute yourself. Professor Zelzer is searching frantically for that mute button. I'll remind him, uh, don't worry, Professor, nobody else can hear me, that it's in the left-hand column just next to the presenter bridge. Hey, there's George. Thank you for joining. Brennan's joining us from the left coast. Hey, Professor, can you hear me? Well, the good news is that after two years of pandemic teaching, all of you have infinite patience as we resolve this short technical difficulty. We're going to help the professor uh, and be patient with him while he... Okay. I appreciate all of your patience. I appreciate uh, you not rolling your eyes and getting all uh, antsy in your desks the way that your students likely do. 
see. Thank you, everybody. Being patient. Let me go back to that slide. Josh, oh, Manuel, thank you so much. Uh, look, what, what affirmation I get from a group of teachers like this. Um, and of course, when you do this in your Zoom Hi, settings. Can you hear me now? Hey, there you are. Sure can. How are you? Okay. All right. Let's hey. uh, can you, you, all right. Sorry, I don't know what was going on. I was unmuted, that, but I think I just had to read. That's okay. It. I'm going to okay. tell you, you couldn't be with a more patient group. You cannot be with a group that's been through these trenches more than this one. So thank you for joining us, okay. Professor. You know, before Thanks. before we get started, and before I turn you turn the screen, the uh, PowerPoint over to you, I wonder if you, I'm going to go back. You can see this on the middle of your screen. I asked the audience tonight to comment with each other about how they would evaluate the performance of a president, um, what kinds of factors they use to gauge success both during and after. Listen, you're a presidential historian. You're a uh, elite scholar. You think about this all the time. How do how do you evaluate the performance of a past president? How do how do you do that in general terms? It's the question I get most. Um, I mean, I think at the most basic level, uh, there is the good or bad question, which reporters love to ask, and I don't find that mm -hmm. an easy question to answer. Uh, people have different perspectives on a presidency. People can see what one American looks at as a failure and another looks at as a success. So personally, as a historian, I like to try to put a presidency in context. I try to understand what were the big issues that shape a four to eight year period? Um, what were some of the underlying political, policy, cultural foundations that explain what we see in any given moment of presidential history? And finally, how does a uh, president exist on a continuum, meaning uh, if we look at the three or four presidents who came before, as well as the rest of the political world, how does that help us make sense of what goes on? Uh, that's how I tend to do it. And I'll just say one other thing is that with Carter, he's really interesting in that um, he kind of brings out the complexity of trying to make simplistic evaluations sometimes. For a long time, he was considered a, a failure. Uh, he was not considered a political success. He embodies the one-term presidency. But as we'll talk about tonight, a lot of journalists and historians are now looking again at some of what he did and, yeah. and seeing success where it was hidden, um, at least if you lived through his term. Certainly, and it, and it seems to imply then that that long view, that be, having the patience to let things percolate and ferment and get some better perspective seems to be key to answering this question. It does, and I think this is also where uh, even doing it uh, soon after, which I've actually done for a bunch of presidencies, really requires a historian's tool not to um, just make a list of top 10 uh, and bottom 10, which I know is very popular. Uh, it's not my kind of thing to do. Uh, but to say, well, here's a historian who studies U.S. history and, and has a sense, um, again, of, of underlying forces and context um, that you can look at what goes on in a, in a richer and more complex way. Yeah, that's a great point. So I know, Professor, that you have uh, submitted um, a handful of video clips that we're going to be playing tonight. When we come to that screen, there'll be a screenshot. You and I will take a pause, and uh, I'll explain to the audience again that it'll be a pop-up, and I'm going to invite them to turn up their volume and sort of settle themselves. So when we get to that slide, we'll sort of eddy out for a moment, and I can get it organized. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to tonight's talk. Thank you. So um, let me get started. Um, and I have to say, I was listening to the introductions um, while you were going, Andy, and I think you said there's a very big drive-by truckers fan in the group. Uh, and I must say, I am one too. And uh, I'm very dear friends with Patterson Hood and Mike Cooley, uh, who I see often. So uh, for the other fan out there, I'll throw that out as a little factoid. Um, so Carter, uh, again, um, uh, for those of you, uh, most of you, I'm sure, uh, know uh, or remember his presidency, teach about his presidency. It's a one-term presidency from 1977 to 81. He really comes into office, as we'll talk about, without having much of a national uh, reputation. Um, the joke when he runs is Jimmy who? Uh, 
uh, after he announces his candidacy. He had been involved in Georgia politics in the legislature and as governor of the state. A little national experience as the head um, of the uh, uh, working for the DNC. But otherwise, he's not really someone very prominent. And it's a, a remarkable story. We'll talk about it. Uh, but in the end, his presidency is quite turbulent. Um, he just has his four years. And not only is he only a one-term president, um, but his presidency ends, Carter being a Democrat, opening the door to Ronald Reagan and what some consider the conservative moment in American politics that would uh, forever undermine uh, the Democratic coalition that Carter had been part of. Um, so he's a, a classic example. I, I have a little timeline of some of the one-term presidents, including um, the former president who wasn't in the slide that I found. So I, I just added him uh, as, as a picture. And, and I wanted to start the discussion with a little bit, basically, of, of what we uh, began with. Uh, how do you think of one-term presidencies? Um, we have this metric that re-election is ultimately the most important part of trying to understand the significance of an administration, trying to teach students um, about uh, who became influential and, and who did not. We think of FDR, obviously, um, and his long run in the White House as a model of what success means, um, because you have that electoral payback, so to speak, or electoral uh, response to the policies that come out of administration, the rhetoric, um, and, and the ideas. But then we have these one-term presidents that we have to think about, and, and how do we evaluate them? And that's why I really was excited to talk about Carter. I wrote a biography of Carter uh, several years ago, and this was one of the themes that drove me. Um, and in recent years, I mean, one of the arguments I made in the book was that even though he was a one-term president, he actually moved forward on many policies and ideas and even had some concrete accomplishments we'll look at tonight that were significant. Uh, and just because he didn't win re-election uh, doesn't mean those did not constitute an uh, important moment in presidential history. Even the presidency itself starts to change as a result of both his 76 campaign and some of what he did while he was in office. Um, and so here is a one-term president where a lot of writers, Jonathan Alter recently, Kai Bird, are looking back uh, and, and rethinking um, some of how this evaluation takes place and some of how we need to understand what the trade-offs are uh, in any given presidency. And, and the second part, which we will come to later, is the political fallout is real, too. Uh, while there is a reevaluation, looking at Carter having uh, put more into uh, motion than we remember, uh, and having more accomplishments than we remember, he does open the door to the Reagan revolution. He is a transitional president where you see the Democratic coalition really suffering. And so um, how do we make sense of both of those? And, and I want to walk through different parts of his presidency tonight. Uh, and I don't want to do it as a lecture so much, I hope, uh, as a conversation. Um, and I, I welcome your thoughts on this, uh, either through the chat or, or however we are doing them. Um, so I'm going to shift to the first part of the um, of the talk, which is really uh, about the 1976 campaign. But I'm I'm happy to discuss anything about how we think of these one-term presidencies. Well, Professor, why don't we? Uh, you know what? I'm going to take one question and then let's okay. move into part two, so we can sort of stay on uh, yes. on time. But this question comes from Brent. Uh, Brent is here in North Carolina as well, and he makes the observation that. President Carter and President John Quincy Adams may have some things in common. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about the parallels between the after presidencies of those two men. Yeah, well, um, I mean, Carter does not uh, enter into formal politics, but his post presidency is really considered now um, not only formidable, but a model of what uh, kind of a younger generation of presidents. Uh, or post-presidents have been able to do. Carter, of course, establishes the Carter Center, um, which is located uh, where uh, in, in Atlanta, as some of you know, it's uh, become a center uh, and a base for foreign policy, diplomatic discussions. Carter's been very involved in democracy building initiatives 
uh, all over the world. And of course, as you showed in that picture, I think early on with Habitat for Humanity, um, he really kind of uh, really offered a way for uh, a president to engage in basic humanitarian activities. So that, that post-presidency is really uh, quite remarkable. Again, different than Adam. Um, but outside of formal politics, he found a place to be a, a real presence on the public stage, both domestically and internationally. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, why don't we move through part two, and then we'll take sure. your questions at the conclusion of that. All right. So, so part two is really thinking about why Carter ended up being president. It, it is a bit of a puzzle. Uh, uh, this is a period in the 1970s when, when most of our presidents had experience on the Hill, they were Washington insiders. And, and in 1976, you have Carter uh, come and, um, and kind of just enter out of nowhere in the minds of many people. And the context of the 1970s is very important. This is a time of growing distrust in government. The combination of Vietnam and Watergate led many Americans to question their confidence in the most basic institutions of American life, from the economy to Congress to the presidency itself. Uh, when I teach about this period, I often start with this video, um, which I think I can play. Um, yeah, I'm, I'll play it. Would you give me the okay. go ahead and I'll play go it. Go ahead. Go ahead. This is Gerald Ford pardoning Nixon. Okay. So uh, to the audience, we're going to be playing a lot of video clips tonight. This is uh, These videos will pop up on your screen. And so please do uh, increase your audio if you need to or position yourself well uh, as we play. This is a 50-second clip. Therefore, I, Gerald R. Ford, President of the United States, pursuant to the pardon power conferred upon me by Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, have granted, and by these presents do grant, a full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon, for all offenses against the United States which he, Richard Nixon, has committed or may have committed or taken part in during the period from July 20, 1969 through August 9, 1974. Okay, so that has come back in, and Professor, there you go. Great. Okay, so they saw the video? Everyone saw the video? Yes. Okay, I can't see it. I just seen the video. So anyway, that's a really important moment in American politics. It's in the aftermath of Watergate, and President Ford basically makes the decision to move forward with trying to heal the nation rather than um, insisting on the accountability of the former president. So he wants to avoid a trial, uh, and he wants to basically move forward. And the fallout is tremendous. A lot of people are furious with Gerald Ford. Um, they, they argue that he had been complicit uh, in the crimes that uh, Nixon had committed. Uh, another important contextual point from the period is the 1974 midterm elections, um, which bring in the Watergate babies, as they're often called. Uh, people like um, the legislators you see in front of you who are very committed to reforming government. They come into office in 74, primarily Democrats, and they're arguing that it's not enough to hope for new leaders, um, but we need to reform and change the way that politics works. Um, you also have in the 1970s a uh, real uh, economic decline. In 1973, the nation had lived through uh, the first part of what would be the oil crisis of the 1970s when OPEC in, uh, imposes an embargo on the United States and Americans are lining up in gas lines, uh, not able to get fuel for their cars, not able to get fuel uh, for the house. Uh, but even though that crisis will subside by 74 and 75, the economy is in terrible shape. Uh, this is the decade of what's called economic stagnation, uh, stagflation. In addition to the energy crisis, you have high rates of unemployment, high rates of inflation happening at the same time. 
So Americans are tired, they're angry, they're frustrated. Sometimes when I'm with my students, I'll show them a clip of the film Network, um, where the protagonist, who is a broadcaster, yells out of his window, um, mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore, which I think really captures the mood of where things were in 1976. And that's important because in the 76 Democratic primaries, as we'll discuss in the next segment, Carter enters into this race. Um, he had announced his candidacy in 1974, and much of the way he campaigns is campaigning against Washington. He starts to articulate themes that will become very familiar to all of us in this webinar, that Washington is the problem, that to be outside of our nation's capital is a virtue, not a failure. The kind of experience that politicians like uh, Lyndon Johnson or Richard Nixon brought to the table um, were not good. And, and to understand why that would resonate, why that would sit so well with a lot of American voters, you have to understand where we were in mid-1970s America. So those are just three components of many. Uh, obviously, the end of the Vietnam War uh, and, and the collapse that takes place in 1975 of the country to communism, it's all part of a brewing, a brew, a mix uh, that is uh, the world in which Carter enters the national stage. Professor, I do have a couple of questions I'd like to bring to you. The first is from Scott. Scott is in uh, nearby Forsyth County, just outside of Winston-Salem. And he noted um, that when you played that clip, we played that clip of Gerald Ford's pardon, that he issued that pardon for the entire length of the Nixon presidency, not just for the events of Watergate. Was that on purpose? Were there things that were um, mistakes that were made or crimes that were committed that you know, is he doing this kind of blanket thing on purpose or was it just incidental? It's a great question. And I have to say it's the first time that anyone has brought that up. Um, the, the Watergate hearings themselves brought up all sorts of issues uh, from the Nixon presidency, many of which were just unrelated to the break in or even the cover up. Uh, everything uh, involving uh, different elements of campaign contributions to uh, alleged uh kind of payoffs, policy payoffs to interested groups that had given to the campaign. So my sense is the sweeping nature of um, that Ford pardon is to bring the whole thing to an end. And uh, as, as I'm sure many of you teach when you teach the students, that was one of the phenomenal parts of the hearings is that it kept expanding. And the more they learned about the presidency, the break-in might have been the smallest part uh, of what had happened. And, and and that was Ford's mission, or that was his hope. Again, many historians think it didn't really succeed, but to bring the whole thing to an end, to remove Nixon as a centerpiece of American politics. Mm, great. Thank you. And one last question. This comes from Mary. Mary's in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Mary should be out enjoying the, uh, the outdoors right now. Uh, Mary's wondering, uh, you know, you, we, again, we played this clip uh, from President Ford. Um, it has such a different context now today. Uh, than it may have. And those of us who grew up in that era certainly have a connotation with it. How do your students at Princeton, some students that these teachers would have taught just a few years ago, how do they respond to that uh, President Ford's uh, pardon and the clip when you start your class with it? Boy, it's changed. I mean, it's funny. I, I've used the clip in, in different ways over the years. And, and early on, it was interesting. Uh, but it wasn't really uh, a kind of center of discussion. But obviously, in the last four years after the Trump presidency and the two impeachments and the controversies that flowed out of it, uh, every time I show it, it generates lots of discussion because it gets right to this issue that is so present right now in, in political debate about how do you balance um, these two needs that a democracy has. We're seeing that with the January 6th commission, for example. I mean, uh, where, where do, in the Department of Justice, what is more important ultimately to kind of try to preserve um, some kind of stability and move away from the worst conflicts that we have? Or is it actually more important uh, to try to achieve accountability and deal with wrongdoing? And uh, I think in the past, um, uh, it wasn't something that the students really had on their mind, but these last few years when I've shown it, it, it becomes one of the most interesting discussions for them.
Uh, it's such an interesting way to see the way that changes. And of course, uh, again, our audience is probably seeing something similar. Well, let's go to section three and I'll continue to take questions. So section three, I wanted to just talk a little about the 76 campaign. One of the articles that I uh, sent out um, that you can look at, it was a piece I wrote in Politico and it was about the Democratic primary, which had 17 candidates. And it was really, it's a, it's a pretty raucous, uh, open-ended uh, Democratic primary. And one of the most notable parts is there's a lot of really heavy-hitting Democrats in that campaign. And people who are known in Washington, people who had a national profile, for example, Frank Church, who's a senator from Idaho, who led the investigations into the CIA and how the CIA had done everything from attempted assassinations to illegal surveillance of American citizens. And and they're all running. And, and Carter is really one of the least known of the candidates. And yet he crafts a campaign for someone who's often remembered as not particularly savvy politically that works perfectly for the times. You can see this picture here uh, of Willie Nelson and uh, Jimmy Carter. There's a great documentary, everyone, that came out. I think it was on CNN. I can't remember. It was about Carter's relationship to rock and roll and country musicians, including the Allman Brothers, who you played earlier. Uh, and that was part of how he positioned himself. I mean, the Allman Brothers played a concert, for example, to help him raise money because he didn't have the kind of fundraising capacity of some of these other candidates. And, uh, and, and not only was Carter pretty cool in 1976 and tried to characterize his candidacy that way as a candidacy that would speak to young people, that would really listen to the anger and frustration they had coming out of the 1960s. But it was also a campaign about him being from outside of Washington. As I said a few minutes earlier, while all his opponents in the primaries tried to use experience to say that's why they should be elected, Carter went the opposite direction. He said, I don't have experience in Washington. I'm not from what is what many Americans thought a, a broken system. Uh, and so he puts together a campaign. He puts out his um, autobiography, Why Not the Best, which emphasizes his roots in Georgia, his roots as a farmer, uh, his roots as an anti-politician. All of his campaign material really stresses, uh, A, a leader for change, as you can see there, and B, uh, the argument that he would say over and over, you can trust me. And let me add a C, he also used his personal biography, that Georgia background, that farming background, as a way to show that he was closer to most Americans than the other Democrats in the primary, and ultimately uh, more so than Gerald Ford, who he'll face in the um, election. Here's a campaign ad from 1976 that you can see a little bit of how he sold himself. Okay, so I will play this campaign ad. And again, to the audience, this is going to pop up on your screen. It's 32 seconds long. Jimmy Carter knows what it's like to work for a living. Until he became governor, he put in 12 hours a day in his shirt sleeves during harvest at his farm. Can you imagine any of the other candidates for president working in the hot August sun? That's why Jimmy Carter has a special understanding of the problems facing everyone who works for a living. America needs someone like this as president. Vote for Jimmy Carter in your Democratic primary. Okay, thank you. That's concluded. Oh, terrific. Okay, so uh, I think that's a good ad uh, to give you a little flavor. Uh, and you'd see variations of this throughout his campaign. It's interesting. His mother would appear in a lot of the ads, the mother, um, his mother, who became a very kind of loved figure in a lot of the country, was a very progressive uh, Southerner. Uh, but he brought his biography, his wife, Rosalind, his daughter, Amy. All of this was the campaign. It was anything but uh, being a very experienced Washington politician uh, that he wanted to stress. And it works. Um, he does very well in the primary. He wins. Uh, he wins the nomination. Jimmy who becomes Jimmy the Democratic candidate. Uh, and uh, formidable figures in the Democratic Party had fallen to him. Uh, then he continues. He runs against President Ford. President Ford has a very difficult campaign because 
Uh, first, uh, he has the baggage of Watergate. He is the Republican running in the aftermath of Nixon's presidency. He is the Republican president who is attacked uh, as a result of the pardon as being uh, really uh, too complicit in what Nixon had done and not really um, a kind of agent of reform so much as an agent of the status quo. And you can see this Time Magazine cover. Uh, he also has a primary challenge, uh, which is also interesting today. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, co comes after him from the right and argues uh, that Gerald Ford is too much of a centrist. He attacks President Ford, for example, for the policy of detente, which was a policy Ford inherits from Nixon of trying to ease relations with the Soviet Union. And Ford continues uh, to engage in this. And Reagan successfully in, in states like Texas and North Carolina rails against him. And in the end, Ford survives the challenge going into the convention Ford is able to round up the delegates he needs, but it's a close call. And, and when an incumbent is primaried, it often leaves them in a weaker position. And then in the general election in fall, uh, Ford's campaign has a bunch of problems uh, besides the fact that the entire Republican Party is struggling. Uh, one, which is somewhat comical, uh, there's a new show that called Saturday Night Live, uh, which has gone on the air. And they start to make fun of a series of times Ford stumbled when he was getting on and off Air Force One. And the comedian Chevy Chase uh, makes President Ford, who really was the most athletic president we've had. He was a superstar football player at Michigan, uh, look a bit like a klutz. Maybe we can just play a little bit of this uh, little Saturday Night Live clip. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to um, scroll through. We'll start it at minute 53. Okay. Okay, we can uh, we can cut it. Okay. All right. There you so go. So there's more of that, and 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 that was kind of one problem with the Ford campaign, um, uh, and and it just the reason it was I think uh, powerful was it captured a sense that uh, a lot of voters had that President Ford was he was stumbling, he was bumbling, he wasn't really a leader, and he wasn't doing anything to address the economic problems that the nation had. There's also a series of famous debates. This is the first one. The second one um, is some uh, a moment many of you might know uh, when Gerald Ford is trying to defend his policy of detente and, and saying in a prepared statement uh, that he didn't believe that uh, Eastern European countries were under the control of the Soviet Union. And he said it as a way to kind of rebuff conservative critics like Reagan, who were saying he was weak on defense because of detente. But the, uh, the reporter interviewing at, who asked the question, Max Frankel, is kind of stunned uh, when he hears Ford say this, because it sounds like Ford doesn't understand um, that the Soviet Union does, in fact, control Eastern Europe. So um, I, I want to kind of move forward with time. Uh, let's play the clip. I can't, I, I can't resist. Uh, let's just play the clip so people can see it. Okay. Here's the Carter Ford debate. 
Okay, you can stop it there. Um, so that's really just another classic moment. And again, it's just a classic gaffe, but it also reflects some of the struggles Ford had positioning himself in that world of 76. And, um, you know, in the end, Ford actually does relatively well. It's one of the closest elections in uh, American history, um, but Carter pulls it off. And Carter, uh, I'll conclude this section by saying, really figured out in the primary and the general election how to position a presidential candidacy uh, as an anti-Washington figure. And he made trust in government his major theme uh, and it was, in the end, successful. And one of the great moments is after the inauguration, um, they're driving in the limo, and Carter and his wife, and you can't see Amy, the daughter, who, who also gets out of the car during the procession and literally walks down Pennsylvania Avenue in uh, something, a moment that at the time didn't really seem like a uh, shtick, for lack of a better word. Uh, Americans were thrilled. Here was this person, Carter, who gets out of his car, and he wants to show he's like everyone else. He does not want the trappings of the presidency. He understood Americans were mad about Watergate and Vietnam. He writes this in his memoir. This is what he was thinking about when he made the decision to get out of the limo. And he takes this march, uh, and the presidency starts on a high note. Many Americans uh, think that he might be uh, the kind of agent of change that was so desperately needed in broken times. Professor, let's take uh, one question. This comes from Lois. Lois is in okay. Oregon, uh, Grants Pass, Oregon. Uh, Lois, who I've never met but comes to many webinars, I believe is a native uh, Pacific Northwesterner. So her question is, in your opinion, was Jimmy Carter the antithesis of a Southerner? Would you say he changed how we, we meaning, I guess, people not in the South, see Southerners? Good, good question. I'm not sure he was the antithesis of the Southerner, meaning that, you know, by the 1960s and 70s, he's part of a cohort um, that's trying to change Southern politics. They're trying to change the image that Americans had. They're trying to make the region uh, more business friendly. They're trying to break um, uh, the hold that older Southern Democrats had on issues like race relations. He's not always uh, perfect on that. And, and um, I, I think that would be for another seminar. There's, there's moments he plays into that kind of politics. But overall, um, as he'll do during his presidency, he's, he's positioned himself very much as someone who's on the side of social and cultural change. And and so he's not uh, the antithesis of the South and that the South was not monolithic by the time he becomes president. He mm -hmm. reflects the changes rather than uh, standing uh, opposite them. That said, he is the first kind of Southern president that the country has seen um, since Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson is, I would add, he's already changing how Americans think of the South. So back in the 60s, we are, you know, he was the Texan who pushed for civil and voting rights. Um, but I think Carter accelerates that process. And part of what he's doing is showing how the South, even as Republicans take over more of that region, can still place themselves in a party that's increasingly liberal on social and economic issues. Mm, fantastic, thank you. One more question. This goes to Rick. Rick is in Richmond, Virginia. He's wondering if you have any uh, knowledge of or insights around a even even a, a brief working relationship between uh, then Senator Biden and President Carter. I I don't remember to be honest. They they did have a relationship, and um, there were certain issues uh, from deregulation to economic policy that Biden had emerged as a, a voice already. Um, by the Carter administration. They were um, both different and similar, meaning Biden still was, even though he was part of this Watergate baby generation, really, he was part of the Democrats who wanted to break the hold of the older generation of Southern leaders and even Northern leaders, which was something Carter was sympathetic to. Um, Biden really wanted to be part of Capitol Hill. He was very invested in politics. Uh, as he remains today, 
Carter never was comfortable, as I'll discuss, with this. This was a big problem for him. Um, so they did interact. I've seen photos of them, and probably if I glance through my research notes, I'd, I'd find times they were actually working on issues together. But they are of that era. They're both different elements of the Democratic 1970s response to the mm. crises of the 60s and early 70s. Great. Thank you for that answer. Let's move to part four. So part four, I just wanted to, uh, there's too much to cover here, but I wanted to go through um, where I started a little bit that as historians and historical writers are looking back, they're finding that it's hard to just characterize Carter as a total failure, as some used to do, uh, or as someone who really didn't know how to move policy. And and what becomes uh, interesting and relevant as uh, you go through this period is that um, Carter has a number uh, of achievements uh, that take place. Uh, either he puts forward issues that will resonate uh, for decades to come, uh, or he actually, on foreign policy especially, is able um, to find ways to move issues and policies and diplomatic agreements that were extraordinarily uh, unpopular, frankly, at the time, or not really on the landscape uh, for most of the Democratic Party. Let me just add, uh, before I continue, uh, for those who are not as familiar with his presidency, um, that uh, he, after the 76 election, had a Democratic House and Senate with large majorities. So politically, he was in a pretty good position. I had the last slide was uh, Big New Brzezinski, who was his national security advisor, uh, Carter famously uh, balanced his advisors. He had Brzezinski, who was more hawkish, calling for a pretty tough response to the Soviet Union at the time. And you had Cyrus Vance, who was Secretary of State, who was uh, much more interested in continuing with detente, even though it had caused President Ford uh, so many problems. Um, one place where Carter is successful in pursuing an initiative uh, are the Panama Canal Treaties. Um, this is an issue that he becomes very engaged in, and he essentially um, uh, signs and gets the Senate to ratify treaties that give control back of the Panama Canal back to the Panamanians. And he believed this was very important because he was determined to restore the way that different parts of the world, uh, especially where the United States was unpopular, saw our role overseas. One response to Vietnam was not just going to be Southeast Asia. It was going to be in places like Panama by taking uh, big steps um, that would show that this president and the country more broadly wanted to move in a, a different direction. And uh, the Panama Canal treaties are a really brutal political battle. It, it shows Carter was not naive at all when he was interested in something. Uh, conservatives are livid, most conservatives, that he agrees uh, to these treaties. Uh, they believe that the Panama Canal is actually a sign of American power, that throughout the 20th century, this was a symbol, uh, not just the physical entity, but the symbol of what it was uh, of our role overseas. And when Carter uh, makes the move to um, give them back, essentially, I mean, that's how it's presented by some of his opponents, particularly on the right, it becomes a fundraising tool for many conservatives, becomes incredibly controversial. And many Senate Democrats, they go along with him and, and they vote uh, for the treaties to ratify the treaties, but they're really unhappy. Um, in 1978, they're frustrated as to why did Carter put them in the position of delivering on this unpopular treaty um, uh, which doesn't have any kind of political payoff at home. But for Carter, it was a big accomplishment. It's part of um, his effort to move forward um, with new ideas in foreign policy. We don't have to show this clip, actually, so we can uh, save a little time. Uh, the Panama Canal treaties are a, a complement to another area of foreign policy where Carter makes significant progress that uh, has influence through today. Uh, and that's in the area of human rights. Um, President Carter believes that human rights needs to actually be at the center of American foreign policy and that in weighing what to do uh, with regard to other countries 
that the State Department literally had to rank and evaluate uh, how governments were treating their citizens, what kinds of human rights violations um, were, were taking place. And um, he, he goes pretty far in this. I mean, he institutionalizes human rights as a centerpiece of what the State Department is going to focus on in years to come. So the Panama Canal Treaty uh, is a treaty that has lasting effect. Um, the Human Rights Campaign is another treaty that has uh, lasting effect. Uh, there's a picture of Ronald Reagan who um, really uses this again um, to rally the support of the right. I'm not sure why those two slides got combined, uh, but on the left, um, that should be a separate slide, but no big deal. Uh, that's the Camp David Accords, a, a, a fourth area where you see President Carter really score one of the biggest diplomatic um, uh, accomplishments in the Middle East is the Camp David Accords negotiated uh, over uh, a long period of time. Uh, Menachem Begin uh, is to his right. Uh, he is the Prime Minister of Israel and Anwar Sadat, who's the head of Egypt, stands to his left. And, and through some pretty arduous uh, negotiations that take place at Camp David, he's able to put together a peace treaty uh, between Egypt and Israel, which uh, even with all the changes that have taken place uh, over the last few decades, remained a pretty enduring um, a treaty in, in a region that has been uh, totally racked by war. So I, I often uh, like to point to that as yet one other uh, area where he's able to move forward. Carter also moves forward with the SALT II negotiations, which are uh, a series of arms agreements that are meant to be a follow-up to what President Richard Nixon uh, had put in, in effect in, in SALT I, with SALT I in 1972. The SALT II agreement won't ultimately come to fruition um, for various reasons, but it's yet another area, and you think of where history will go, uh, where Carter is one president who is arguing that the Soviet uh, Union and the Cold War, the whole thing has to come to an end uh, through agreements and diplomacy, uh, not uh, simply war. Um, and, what, and so those are just some examples of policies that historians are now looking back on. Obviously, in the end, uh, foreign policy um, goes in a different direction politically. Um, the Iran hostage crisis, which starts in November 1979, uh, when uh, revolutionaries are angry that uh, the Carter administration had allowed the Shah of Iran, who the revolutionaries were toppling, uh, to come into the United States for medical treatment here in New York at, at the Cornell Hospital, uh, it leads to the seizure of, um, of hostages. And for much of the late uh, part of his presidency in 1980, the news is absolutely consumed with this story. And Carter looks weak, he looks impotent, um, and as he spends much of his time working behind the scenes, uh, trying to negotiate a deal uh, to release the hostages who are being held, uh, the country has seen story after story about failure uh, and his inability uh, to do so. Uh, here's a quick, uh, why don't we play a little bit of this news clip? Okay, let me pull this one up. Um... So, Professor, uh, tell me the name, the title. Is it is it this one with um, ABC, the ABC coverage? coverage. I yeah. got it. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Okay. 
So that's uh, the coverage. But one of the interesting things, so, so he suffers um, in, in part because a lot of what he does, he generally avoids any kind of military response. And a lot of what happens from November through the end of his presidency is he's uh, engaging in a series of complex negotiations behind the scenes. Uh, as the negotiations are happening, again, Americans don't see anything. There's one military operation um, that is unsuccessful. It's a total disaster. Uh, and, and it's used um, Operation uh, Claw, Desert Claw uh, as, a, as a evidence by Ronald Reagan by 1980. Uh, it happens in April uh, that the administration doesn't know what it's doing. Uh, and then it's kind of coupled with the Soviets invading Afghanistan. Uh, at the same time. And uh, Carter tries to uh, kind of accelerate his rhetoric against the Soviet Union. We don't have to show this clip uh, and, and, and be tough in response. But by the time the November election is going to happen, uh, Reagan is using foreign policy against him. But the reason it's interesting and the reason I bring it up is in the end, with the Iran hostage crisis, Carter actually does negotiate a solution. And he gets the Iranians to agree to release the hostages. Uh, they won't do it until Reagan is literally inaugurated. They do it right as he's inaugurated as a way to humiliate Carter. Um, but he is able to free the hostages. So there's a series of areas in foreign policy, the Panama Canal treaties, the Camp David Accords, uh, the Iran hostage crisis, and more in human rights, where I think there's room to kind of look at him uh, with students and, and, and try to understand um, this presidency as doing much more than was even apparent at the time. And, and one other area, just to move to the end um, of where this was, was in conservation. Um, one area where Carter, he gets some watered down legislation, but he's very eager uh, to move forward with the issue of energy conservation. Uh, there's a second round of the oil crisis that takes place in 1979, um, where uh, OPEC uh, once again uh, cuts off the supplies that are available to the United States. There's long gas lines. Um, there's this feeling that we are being held hostage uh, at, at the time, uh, not just the Americans who are in Iran, but the entire country. And Carter, uh, throughout his presidency, before the second round of this crisis, but through it, is pushing Americans to make conservation a much uh, more important part uh, of American public policy. And as my wife, Meg Jacobs, who's also a historian, has written about in a book called Panic in the Pump, a Panic at the Pump, uh, he is moving forward with everything from solar energy to investment in new kinds of fuels to different measures to try to uh, wean Americans off this dependence that was so debilitating uh, at the time. Uh, and again, a lot of this is seen as a failure. Um, the legislation he does get is is pretty mild compared to what he originally sought. And he famously, I saw this was a question, uh, makes a speech in July of 1979 uh, about the crisis of confidence in this country known as the malaise speech, where he decides to talk about what Americans can do better to make this country stronger. And, and it's very esoteric. Part of what he talks about is moving away from the rampant consumption uh, that we focus on and a constant focus on uh, purchasing and, and material goods. And, and, and it's almost a spiritual talk. And, and the talk backfires. Uh, many people feel that in the end, Carter was blaming Americans for the crisis of the 1970s rather than saying he will lead them through it. Um, but we can show a little bit of the clip. I don't know how long. This looks longer than uh, I hope. So we can show a couple minutes to, to give people a flavor of the address. And I'll, I'll end by just having a few comments on it. Fantastic. So I'm going to launch this in your right. It is, it is pretty long. Yeah. So you, you signal me when you want to uh, take okay. a break. Okay. 
All right, I think we can bring it uh, to a close. I didn't, I didn't clip that one the right way, um, but I want to have time for the rest. So uh, I guess just to conclude, that even that speech is really interesting because it's emblematic. Some of you might teach it this way as uh, a miscalculation uh, of a president and a moment of leadership that really doesn't work. But like the rest of what I talked about in this section, uh, I think there was just a lot of policy movement that was quite important some of it happens at the time, like Camp David. Other parts of it, like his shift to conservation in the long run, were very important. And he was starting a conversation that we have today. But policy success doesn't always mean political success. And I guess I'll stop there before we get into the next section, because that's very much part of the story. For him, leadership often meant going on to issues that mattered, tackling issues that were urgent to the nation, even if politically they were not the smartest move for himself or for his party. Great. Uh, I do have a few questions that have come forward. Um, let me start with, uh, with Ron. Ron is joining us from Rutland, Vermont. And Ron is wondering if, um, if you agree with the statement that uh, as a Southern Democratic candidate, Carter uh, may have been the only hope the Democrats had for victory in the 70s particularly since he was able to carry the entire South. What, was he the, the, the right candidate at that point? I think he was the right candidate. I don't know if he was the only one. It's always hard to deal with counterfactuals, but we need to remember that the South remained the base of the Democratic Party. And um, the Republican, uh, the shift of the South to the Republican Party, which now is, is, has been locked in place until recently, hasn't finished yet. Uh, the South is still very democratic. It's still a hugely important region. And Carter showing how he could deliver the South without being an older kind of Democrat was quite important. And he speaks both to the southernness of the Democratic Party, but also to this Watergate baby uh, desire for change. So he was in some ways a perfect uh, combination. The one area he had trouble, as we'll talk about next, is with the traditional Democratic coalition, uh, i.e., unions, um, the civil rights community, where he never really figured out a way to connect. But I do think that was an important part of, of why he was successful, and he was the right candidate for the time. Mm. Uh, Brent, who is a teacher uh, in Caldwell Schools, um, noted that when he often uses the crisis of confidence speech, he takes the date off and has students read them, and uh, they're surprised at how relevant it is today. Uh, Professor, how do you use the crisis of confidence clip or speech in your own teaching? I, I use it, again, less as – I think that's a great exercise, uh, actually. Um, and I think that uh, is a great way to get across the point, because today when you hear it, you, you hear a president who really is quite attuned uh, to many of the problems, uh, not only that we faced, but we would continue to face at the time. I use it as an end point, really. Um, about a decade um, where our institutions had come under question, under fire, where distrust becomes one of the most important elements of American politics, shaping electoral politics, shaping speeches, and showing how president uh, trying to wrestle with this and seeing why um, even a president who's pretty astute at the moment in um, prescribing what's going on um, really has no political options for dealing with that. And that's very much the story um, for where we were as the decade ended. Mm, great. Uh, one more question, and then we'll move to the last part and then take some questions at the end. This comes uh, from Lois. Lois, you get a second question tonight. She's wondering if you can comment on the influence that Ted Koppel and Nightline may have had on the Iranian hostage crisis. Do you think there was a, a difference? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that's when the show comes into being. And uh, we still were in an era um, before that where the main news for most Americans was the nightly news broadcast, which was a half hour show around dinner time, uh, 22 minutes of programming. The rest was advertising. Uh, and this is, you know, it had been hosted by people like Walter Cronkite. Uh, it was shorter. It was more contained. And you see a shift. Uh, and these new programs are starting nightly news shows like Ted Koppel, and they focus on this. And night after night, Americans are watching uh, this crisis. They're seeing stories about the hostages. They're seeing and hearing of this crisis that we're going through. And it's very difficult politically for Carter, especially since Carter is someone who's 
using a slow, deliberate way to bring this to an end without bloodshed, uh, I think for a lot of voters, it compounded the notion that this was a presidency uh, that had lost control uh, of, of issues. Great. Well, we have about 20 minutes left. Why don't we move through the next part? And again, I'll remind the audience to submit any formal questions to the Ask the Professor tab. Okay. Uh, so the last section gets to this uh, issue that one of the ways in which Carter really struggled, um, and again, it's not success or failure, was in uh, kind of building and maintaining a political coalition. He never was comfortable with old-fashioned legislative politics. He could do it when he wanted. He does get the Panama Canal Treaty through the Senate, but often he has fractious relationships with Democrats on the Hill, the people he needs as allies. Here you see Speaker Tip O'Neill of Massachusetts, uh, and they have a very fraught relationship. O'Neill believed that Carter didn't really respect legislators. He didn't help Democrats on the Hill get what they needed uh, for their constituencies. And they would spend four years often at odds um, work, rather than working as allies. And Carter doesn't have that much interest uh, during his time in office uh, at really nurturing this. He had his vice president, who you see in this photograph to his right, Walter Mondale, who had been a prominent senator um, from Minnesota. And part of why Carter had brought him on board was to develop better relationships with Capitol Hill, with the Democrats on Capitol Hill, but that never really happened. And, and some of it is interpersonal. Um, some of it is the fact that Carter is putting policies, as I said, that don't really resonate with what Democrats want. So for a Democrat like Speaker O'Neill, um, the fact the president invested so much energy in the Panama Canal treaties instead of dealing with stagflation just didn't make sense to him, and it actually angered him uh, because it was putting Democrats in a perilous position. Many civil rights leaders who, who Carter interacted with and brought into the White House were often frustrated um, that he was not really dealing as president with civil rights policy. He was not working hard on economic programs, including public spending, um, that would benefit uh, the Black American community. Uh, there's a lot of tension with organized labor. That's George Meany, the president of the AFL-CIO, uh, sitting there next to Carter. I think he has a, his famous cigar in hand. And a lot of organized labor actually felt that President Carter was hostile to them, that he kind of bundled organized labor in the same uh, bundle as corrupt interest groups and uh, the system that needed to be changed, even though unions had been the heart and soul of, uh, of the Democratic coalition since the 1930s. And, and, and famously, in 1979, Carter appoints a new uh, head of the uh, Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker, uh, who's also a Princeton professor, and Volcker will embark on his uh, version of stopping inflation, which will be a very uh, draconian series of interest rate hikes that basically crush the economy so to contain prices. And uh, the tensions and the problems that Carter had as a coalition builder, um, as opposed to a policymaker, all come to a head in 1980 when Ted Kennedy, the senator from Massachusetts, uh, tries to defeat Carter in the primaries. Uh, he's unsuccessful. Carter is able to beat him. But Carter, uh, Kennedy is very popular. And there's many Democrats, including kind of traditional Democrats, who just like uh, Kennedy much better. And Kennedy makes this speech at the Democratic Convention, which I'll show, which captures the hearts and souls of many Democrats much more than anything Carter was able to say. Why don't we play a clip of it? 
All right, we can move forward. Um, so that was a, a important speech, and why don't I just go through this next section? We can take questions, and and so yeah, that's good. where Cart that's where Carter is uh, going into the 1980 election. He has a divided party. A lot of Democrats on the Hill are are kind of lukewarm to him. There's a sense the Democrats are struggling. In 1980, he's facing off against Ronald Reagan, who's not just a Republican, but a Republican connected to this expanding conservative movement. Uh, and all the policy uh, gains and ideas that President Carter uh, put forward seemed overshadowed uh, by the Iran crisis, by the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, by the economic stagflation. Uh, and Reagan uh, gives this famous little uh, campaign moment, which I think captures um, how he had been able to position and define what Carter was. Why don't we play it? Okay. So, um, so uh, obviously we, we know how that story ends. Uh, Reagan goes on to defeat Carter. Uh, I won't show these final clips. These are just some good news clips of, of the victory. And it's a very significant victory. Carter's uh, uh, not only defeated, but he's opened the door to this real revolution in American politics, some would argue, or at least a sea change um, that would take place under uh, Ronald Reagan. So, so all of this just uh, raises interesting questions about how do we think of this? Uh, is this an exercise when we teach about the Carter presidency in trying to recover um, a, a president who was more successful than we remember? Uh, how do we think of a president who is able to actually move forward on many relevant, significant long-term policies or enter big ideas as he does in the crisis of confidence, the Malay speech that will be important for Americans to hear, but at the cost of building a, a coalition that outlasts him. Uh, this is what I often talk about with students. It's not insignificant when a one-term president is succeeded uh, by an administration and a coalition that will try to undo that a lot of what the party before them had built over decades. And uh, I think that's, I don't have no answer to how we think of this, but I think that is the conversation that we have to have uh, when we think of Carter, when we think of one-term presidents, and, and most importantly, when we think of the tensions and complexities of late 1970s politics. Professor, thank you so much for uh, for walking us through that story. We've got several questions that have come up. Um, I'd actually like to start by coming back to this slide because we, you know, it was up and it was up relatively briefly. Uh, but I noticed yeah. that Fabiola yeah. noticed just how <laughs> incredibly red this image is, and in yeah. particular on the coastline. So uh, maybe this ties a little bit into President Carter's legacy. Maybe it's just the evolution of the last you know, thir thirty years, three decades. But tell us, uh, talk to us a little bit about how this map is different today than it was in 1980. Um, you know, th it is a bi-coastal map now than it wasn't then. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about why that might be or how that transition occurred? Well, one, one thing to always notice when we're dealing with any election through 1984, the landslides still happen. 
Uh, and that's interesting. I mean, presidential candidates could actually shift huge swaths of the electorate where today that just doesn't happen. So today we're in a world where you're not talking about presidents who can do that. You're talking about presidents who won uh, slivers of the electorate, who flipped one or two or three states, as opposed to getting a map that looks like this. Uh, the coast, uh, we, we've settled into a period which is much more rigid, not just in terms of a more polarized map, um, but a coastal versus non-coastal map. And I think uh, Republicans, the flip side of the success of this era, is they moved further away from being able to really do uh, especially well on those heavily populated coastal areas. And finally, it's a reminder of the Electoral College and the power that the Electoral College had. Um, because in, in some of these states, Carter still did well with large parts of the population um, uh, in terms of the popular vote, but he was swept in that Electoral College. But I think the, the absence of landslides in that coastal versus non-coastal split is really what's different than where we were then. Mm. Uh, several people have asked this question. Uh, I'm going to credit it to Jennifer, who is in South Florida. Um, what effects did third-party candidate Anderson have on this map? He was important. And uh, so uh, John Anderson from Illinois runs as a third-party candidate. Uh, and in some ways, he picks up on some of the themes that uh, Carter ran on in 76 uh, about reform and uh, about moderation and independence. And Carter's in a tough position because it's a classic story of a guy who ran as an outsider in 76, but you can't do that in 1980 because he is the, he's the ultimate person in power. And I, I think a lot of uh, kind of poll, pollster types or people who study this element of elections think in the end, uh, Anderson took votes away from Carter rather than Reagan, that it was the same appeal. It was uh, who didn't want to vote for someone who was connected to um, that rightward element of American politics, and so they split the vote. In the end, I'm not sure that really um, was what uh, tilted this toward Reagan. I think his coalition was stronger than that. Um, but if, if someone suffered, uh, Carter suffered. Mm. This question comes from Lori. Lori is in western North Carolina, East Tennessee, the the, uh, the the Tri Cities area. Lori asks. In fact, she states she'd love to hear your thoughts about this. What do you think about the media coverage of the Carter presidency and eventually the Carter Reagan race? Uh, do you think that there are preferences or bias of any kind? And did, did that coverage? Does that coverage affect our feelings about the Carter presidency? It's a good question. I mean, I I don't know if there is a political bias, meaning uh, one partisan perspective versus the other. And that was not the media world at the time. Reporters were especially careful not to, to do that. Um, but I do think you can see, look, it, it's, it's a great question, actually, because we're, we're now by the late 70s, early 80s, in an era where television and televised style news coverage is gaining um, a lot of sway. And this gets back to the Ted Koppel question. And part of the nature of some of television news, which has great reporting often, but it does lean toward uh, often sensationalism or it has a shorter term focus than you might get in a newspaper or magazine. Uh, and uh, I think there's a certain element of drama in television news, not intentional, um, but I think it's just the nature of the medium in terms of how they're even describing or the visuals they are presenting. And so I don't think, I think that hurt Carter because again, I think part of the reason some of what he had done or his style of governing, which was often lower key, it was often, I'm going to work behind the scenes on these issues, uh, didn't mesh well with the fast pace of a television era press. A second way in which I think he struggled, this is the era of investigative journalism. After Watergate, there's many more reporters um, who are determined to root out corruption, to question authority, uh, and to really speak truth to power, as you often hear. And there's a lot of virtue of that. A lot of good reporting came out of that. But it was hard because Carter, here he was, a, a candidate and then president who promised to change. Uh, but by the end, I think a lot of these reporters were either uncovering uh, kind of uh, questionable elements of his presidency. He has some uh, scandals like Landscape. We have the post-Watergate scandal uh, era. Uh, 
uh, and just being critical and questioning his authenticity. That was a common theme of the media. Is he really the non-presidential kind of person that he says he is? Is part of what he's doing more scripted and manufactured? And, and these were, the questions were fine. You know, reporters were going to never be seduced by leaders again, so to speak. Um, but I think he struggled in both realms. And, and both are parts of media coverage that continue right through to, the, to today. Mm. And and Billy Beer certainly didn't help him either. Um, right. Uh, this <laughs> this question comes from uh, Raquel. Raquel's in Southern California, Los Angeles Unified School District, and you know this is a question that Raquel submitted early in 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 our time tonight. Uh, I saved it for the end. I suspect it's one you get relatively frequently. And she notes that Carter, like Carter, I should say, uh, President Trump ran as an outsider. What kinds of parallels do you find between the political situations that made br both of them approach uh, approach with that aspect of being an outsider? Well, the outsider theme is one. I don't think it's simply um, Carter and Trump. And, and the comparison is a, a useful one to think about. I mean, they both position themselves against Washington, uh, both in different ways boasted of how they – didn't have the same kind of elected uh, experience as their opponents. Um, and it wasn't simply Trump, though. My point is, we've had lots of candidates run this way. This became, I mean, Carter set the template that many candidates, other than George H.W. Bush and Joe Biden, uh, the rest all ran very similar ways. It wasn't surprising Trump did as well. But they're very different kind of politicians. I mean, Carter really was a policy wonk. He was focused in, as, uh, with his engineering background on tackling uh, public policy challenges that had uh, really um, shaped the nation. He got into the minutia and the details, and that's not what uh, Trump was. I think Carter, even with his outsiderness, still believed in governing and believed in some of the processes and, and limits of what a president could do and what an elected official could do, where I think uh, Trump felt he was more freed from any of those. Um, and, uh, and in the end, I, I mean, I think uh, Carter was still very much more enamored with what we think of as what a president does, even if he was doing it in different ways, in terms of leadership, in terms of bringing connections between peoples, rather than finding points of division. Uh, and, and Trump was very different. Trump was about division. He was about stoking division rather than finding a new center. Carter was all about finding a new center. And so there is a commonality. But in the end, when you look at the detail, they're very different kinds of politicians. Mm, fantastic. Thank you. Two more questions with the few minutes we have remaining. Uh, this next one is a little bit of a sideways turn. This comes from Kerry. Carrie's also in Los Angeles. Kerry asks, what caused Carter to choose the standard customary units of measurement over the metric unit? That's a good question, and that's an engineering question, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass on that. I don't actually know the details. I, I would give an answer that's not 100%. I don't want to do that, but it's a great question. Thanks, Gary, for that question. Um, my last question is going to, uh, again, several people have mentioned it in the chat box and also submitted it as a question, but I'm going, to, I'm going to cite Frank in nearby Raleigh, North Carolina with this question. Professor, in your opinion, was, was Jimmy Carter the right man at the wrong time? <laughs> it's, a, it's a really interesting way to think of it, and I, I, I think there's some truth to that. I think um, he, he was the right person in terms of uh, what he believed needed to happen to make this democracy better. I think he was hitting on themes that would resonate in both parties, frankly. Uh, he was tackling issues that many politicians and even voters didn't see were going to be as central as they became. Um, but he was operating in a moment uh, where the political winds were shifting uh, and his own party was struggling, uh, both in ways that would ultimately not sustain him. Uh, and, and allow his successor to undo some of what he was trying to put together. So I think that's a useful way to at least start a conversation about, about Carter and think about why was it the wrong time. In some ways, it should have been the right time. I mean, 
Uh, how could a person who campaigns on reforming government after Watergate not be in the right place at the right time or dealing with energy conservation in the middle of an oil crisis? That seems like the right place at the right time, but it wasn't. And the why wasn't it? What was going on in the country that culminates in that Reagan election? It's a, it's a great, I think, way to start uh, students uh, and help them start thinking about unpacking that moment. Thank you, and I think a good place for us to conclude our seminar tonight. Professor Zelizer, thank you so much for your time tonight, for your insights, and for joining us for tonight's webinar. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Bye, everyone. I also, I also want to thank uh, all of our audience uh, for joining us tonight. Please do follow the National Humanities Center on our social media feeds and channels for upcoming opportunities and activities. Certainly, that includes the webinar series that you're part of tonight, but we have many other uh, opportunities, both in-person and virtual and we would love to, to bring you to Durham or to work with you long distance and continue to uh, give you access to wonderful scholarship and scholars like we have tonight. That does include our next webinar. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, that's, we have a double header this week. So two nights from now, uh, we uh, will be joined by Ronald Davis from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Ronald will be sharing with us his work on the enslaved and free black cowboys of tennis. Of, of tennis, I apologize, of Texas. Um, please do plan to join us. Uh, if you haven't signed up, uh, please go back to the registration page and do so. Share this with your colleagues. We would love to see you at our next webinar. Have a great day at school tomorrow. It's early in the week, I realize, uh, but I hope that this week is seamless and, uh, and affirming for you. Uh, do great work with your students. We really do appreciate all of uh, what you do to contribute to humanities education, and we're pleased to be able to support you. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time on the Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night.